Okay, so I've worked Ozzy, his normal riding session. Uh, we've done close to an hour of work. We worked with walk about half the time and trot about half the time. I worked uh, just like on the long reins, sort of worked on um, equalizing the time between walk and trot and then asking for more frequent upward transitions to get him working in the trot a bit more. So I'm just going to show you quickly the different phases of his normal training session. So today, because it's a little bit breezy and cool and the neighbors are busy and he was distracted, I started with a small figure eight, which just works to kind of keep their attention, keep their mind in the game more than staying on one direction. It's a little harder to balance on a constant change of direction. So I'm just turning and like you can see, after his warm up, the long and low in the walk is a little easier for him to maintain. He's been using his hindquarters quite well, so he's going to be a bit slow. And he still is adjusting his neck position a lot. That's the coming and going of his hindquarters and back, right? So I'm just keeping the neck as straight as I can. I might have to bend it a little to get my turn. I'm balancing this, my seat left to right and trying to use the turn with a straight neck ideally. If he gets distracted and I have to get his mind back in the game, I'll take a little bend of the neck to get the steering. Every time I bend the neck, it's going to cause the barrel to roll to the outside. So I do it if I have to, to get his attention. Um, but I would really prefer that he can do these tight turns with his neck as straight as possible. And when it's long, especially on a loose rein, as he lengthens the neck, what that tells you is he's changing the use of his top line muscles because his back and hindquarters started to work better. They started to do what they're meant to do which is stabilize the forward motion and control the body weight a little bit. The long and low means he doesn't have enough engagement or enough lifting of the back spinal flexion to really control his body weight when he lengthens the muscles of the top line. So that's why I said long and low right now, as that gets more and more consistent, I would move his balance on towards basic balance and a little bit more elevation through the front end by getting more engagement and increasing the spinal flexion. Right now, his rides and what takes the time is really working him through the strong habit he has to drop his back and disengage the hindquarters. And it's why he has the hock arthritis. It's why his hindquarters and back are a little weak and wobbly, but it's improved quite a bit. So this would be my warm up for as long as I felt like I needed it for him to stabilize and start to get more consistent with his neck long. Then from there, I typically still do the right first because out of both hind legs, he struggles more to really use the right hind leg compared to the left hind leg. Going left, he falls on the left shoulder, but it's because he's not handy with his right hind leg. So the steering is a little worse and I don't have quite as much pushing power when he tracks left compared to right because he's a little less stable. To the right, getting that hind leg to really come up underneath him and stabilize is the root cause of his little bit of crookedness. Are we gonna poop? And you can see why he needs to stop and poop. He does not lift his back very much in motion yet. So now that I've gotten off today my small figure eight instead of a small circle on one direction and then the other, am I still tracking? Yes, I am still tracking, okay. So when I first go out on the bigger circle, I have a couple of options. 
I could just let him walk on the bigger circle, spending more time with his neck long by not being as engaged as the tighter turns or smaller circles, right? As soon as he starts to lengthen the neck, and especially if he falls into long and low, the pushing is part of building the strength of the back and hindquarter. So I can choose to push until he shortens the neck, or I could go ahead and push right into a trot transition, knowing he's going to lose his balance for the transition. Right, that's not too bad. So there I let him slow down a little bit. Now I'm gonna ask for the trot again. And he's still pretty likely to over curl the neck or shorten the neck upward like that during the upward and during the downward transition. So from that point, if I decide to make the transition, because I can decide not to make the transition, I can just increase the pushing force until the neck elevates but remains long. So in other words, if I let him if I give him the time to stabilize the back and hindquarters, he's gonna fall into long and low like that. So option number one, I can push, but there he starts shortening the neck. So that's the maximum authentic pushing I'm gonna get before he starts pulling himself forward into the trot transition. So that's option number one, is just increase the push in the walk, but don't ask for the transition if he re if he shortens the neck muscles then he's already dropped his back and lost his hindquarters option number two i like to start off at least in the beginning of the trot work from long and low and then whether or not he drops his back and disengages the hindquarter like that i could keep pushing until he gets into the trot I always allow the downward transition because that's how he's re-stabilizing. And there's as much value to the engagement of the hindquarters in the downward transition that he chooses as there is in the upward transition that I choose. So then I can let him stabilize at the walk a little bit. If he's pulling or acting out, I can just wait longer. Once he's back in long and low, whether the transition is good or bad, we're gonna push into trot. And you can see he's less dramatic with his neck. But the less dramatic he is with his neck, the fewer strides of trot I get, right? So I kind of let him stabilize, right? Then I push for another transition, whether he loses his balance in the transition or not. Then the last phase of the work, after I sort of do that for at least five minutes, the last phase of, say, working on the trot is just to shorten the timing between him breaking to the walk and getting back into the trot. And this was what we were doing in the last couple of trot videos. And you can see when I do it that way, he's going to be more dramatic in changing the use of his neck. We're gonna see more struggle because it's hard for him. But if I, so I'll show you what I mean by that. This is option number three. So even though there I let him break to the walk and his swoops, as soon as he breaks to the walk, I'm starting to ask for the next trot. So this is option number three. I don't give a leg aid once he's trotting. I want him to break and then I immediately start asking for the next trot transition. And you can see I really lose my long and low, but the reason we worked on it this way is because the downward and upward re repeated transitions help him find and stabilize his rhythm of the trot so that the trot gets smoother and easier to ride and that helps his balance even though we don't see a lot of strides of long and low in the trot, right? He's no longer sort of like speeding up and rushing and then slamming on the brakes and resisting my leg aid. All of his challenges and balance issues are the same, but now they're more minimal. 
So as I click in the timing, he still breaks to the walk, but I immediately start asking for the trot. Once he feels stable in the trot and comfortable, he'll maintain the trot because it's less work than a million transitions. But it's the millions of transitions that help him learn how to stabilize in the trot. Right? So then the, I'll show that again to the left. So then once I've warmed up the hindquarters with tight turns, figure eight or one direction on a small circle, come out to my bigger circle and sort of gently start working on trot transitions, giving him more walk time in between each trot to stabilize this long and low posture, regroup, then we try the next transition. Then after about five minutes of that, we go to the third phase where even if he loses his balance, he's allowed to break to the trot when it, or from the trot to the walk whenever he likes. And I immediately start asking for the next trot. So we're stringing the trot transitions closer together. Once I feel there's an improvement at the trot, right? Then I'm gonna do this again and just sort of let him chill out at the walk, maybe throw in a couple of easy transitions, right? Or, and or, I could go back, right? After a few minutes of walking on the big circle, I could come back just like I did on the long reins and let him catch his breath on the small circle again, right? So the small circle is where I get more engagement, but it challenges his ability to stay straight, right? So it's always gonna be a slower speed on the small circle because he has his hind legs slightly closer to his center. Right? And you can see also even in this, after we do a bit of trot, there's a lot less pushing on the bit, a lot less sort of pulling on the reins, slamming the head down, tossing the head up. So the steadier use of his neck is the direct reflection of the steadiness and control that he's developing through his back and hindquarter. That's what makes the neck hold a steady position. So all of these fluctuations are just him still learning how to stabilize on the back half compared to the front half, right? So then we'll go around the other way. And again, I'm gonna go sort of phase one, let him have a little bit of time in long and low at the walk, time my transitions to when he's in a few strides of long and low. If he's not getting to long and low, then I'm gonna keep working on the straightness and keeping his attention. I might make the circle a little smaller, a little bigger. I can just play with it until he finds enough stability in his back and hind quarters on this bigger circle with less engagement, just to be able to do that, right? So then I'm gonna start by asking for a trot only while he's long and low. As soon as he starts to shorten his neck like that, my legs come off, I abandon ship on my trot transition. I help him get straight again, get stable again, and wait for him to shift back into long and low. Then I can push again, right? And I can keep pushing until I either get the trot like that, or he starts to shorten the neck upward or really curl it backwards, right? Then the next phase is, even if it's a bad transition like that, I'm still gonna go all the way to trot with my leg aid and the use of my whip, right? But I'm gonna give him a little bit more time. I also find he needs a little extra time in the walk between the trot transitions going left in general. The right, he can reorganize a little bit faster. That's becoming his easier direction at trot. And to the left, I typically have to give him a little longer, even, that was better, 
even if I'm going to time my transitions closer together to get more strides of trot. Still takes them just a few extra strides compared to the other direction. Right, so again, I'm gonna start timing as I go through his workout. I'm gonna start timing my leg aids, whether he keeps his balance or loses it. I'm just gonna start asking for the trot transition a little sooner after he breaks to the walk. And you'll see, as we go through a few of these, he starts to smooth out his trot a little. He quits resisting my leg aid so much, and he doesn't rush forward. I even get a little bit more frequently this attempt at long and low. Right? So that's where he's at, sort of towards the end of his workout, and he knows it's the end of his workout. I know, we went a little longer than an hour. So I'm just going to show you the routine and what it looks like to ride by the end of the ride. It's still the first, you know, 15 minutes that you're working on walk and trot when you first get on. His old habits are still strong. It takes most of the hour to work through it. But instead of getting maybe one good stride at the end of 15 minutes, I'm getting a lot more consistency in the walk and trot with him being able to keep that length of his neck lighter to my leg aid, better control over his speed and his downward transitions. And so that is kind of what he looks like right now under saddle. And again, once I finish my trot work in either direction, I like to come back to sort of the smaller circle because the trot work, especially if I'm allowing the imbalance through the transitions, He's going to get some benefit, but he's also going to get the side effect of feeling less stable, right? So at the beginning and the end of the ride, just like the long reins, if I work him on the smaller circle, doesn't have to be perfect, but if I can get him to turn with the neck straighter, then I'm building up the stability with more engaged hindquarters and more length through his top line really loud today and a helicopter just went over. I'm sure you could hear that. The neighbors have something going on. So he's doing really well for all the activity that's going on today. Plus it's cool and windy. So you can see the steadier he gets in his back and hind quarter, the less dramatically he changes his neck use. The more consistently he finds sort of long and level or long and low, right? What I really want to see that tells me he's overcoming the habit of dropping his back and disengaging the hindquarters is to see less and less dropping of the pole over curling the neck or shortening the neck upward. All of those are just his, his body seeking stability when he's lost it from here back. So it's a work in progress, but all of his biggest changes are now much easier for him. So it's just going to be a matter of continuing until Ozzy discovers better and better coordination, which he's most of the way there, and then also develops the muscular support, especially in his core muscles. The muscles that support the spine, the use of the pelvis all through the back, I'm not talking belly core muscles, I'm talking the deeper muscles along the spine. That's where he's weak, and it's going to take time and repetition for those muscles to strengthen. In that process, you'll start to see the hindquarter get rounder rather than kind of pointy like it is. The neck has to be consistently longer than this over curling and dropping the pole and his movement will feel more stable and easier to ride, walk and trot, and the canter will be manageable without him really getting upset. The reason he gets upset going into canter is because it's difficult for him. He doesn't feel stable, he doesn't feel in control of his body, 
and it's hard for him to swing the hind legs that far forward, which the canter requires. So I would keep working on the ground. He's pretty close to where I could canter him under saddle, but there's no harm in letting him get good at it through the groundwork and making it easier on yourself when you try it under saddle. And same with the trot, frankly. So the most important thing is changing his posture, right? So playing with different figure eights, tight turns, big turns, big circles, little circles. You're trying to improve the hindquarter engagement and maintain the internal straightness. That's what gives him the length of the neck on any path of travel or any speed. And during the transitions will kind of be the last thing that comes together for him. I'm getting some, I'm getting better transitions more frequently. So it's getting easier, but it's still the transitions and the canter work are still where he goes into his old posture, old habit of use the most. Well done, Ozzy. And this really is our last video for the case study on Ozzy because he is heading to his home. <laughs>